Next up, we have Christopher Wynn from uh, Adatao, who's a sponsor of the summit. Adatao has been a huge fan and champion of Spark for a long time now. When I first met Christopher was at the first AMP camp preparation uh, meeting where he came, gave freely of his time to help us debug the curriculum, which eventually turned, uh, which is written by grad students and postdocs in the AMP lab, eventually turned into uh, a pretty large beast that sits online and hundreds of people a week walk through these exercises to learn with the uh, hands-on about using the different components of badass. Um, those will be the same exercises that we use tomorrow, actually. And uh, Christopher is at the startup called Adatao, who is using Spark as a core component, and he'll be talking to us about that. Thank you, Andy, for stalling while Michael sets things up. OK. So we don't, we're not connected. OK. So the reason we're busily setting all this up is because we actually have done uh, a pretty silly thing. We're actually going to try to show you a live demo. Uh, and, and this is the network connection I'm using because we find that the Wi-Fi is too slow. So if anybody has a faster connection than this, let me know. Uh, so I also want to apologize in advance that our talk is actually longer than 30 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to that's during the, uh, the, the, the dry run, so I'm going to speed through some of the slides that I think can be, can be skipped over. Uh, okay. You, would you like me to do this? <laughs> okay. Cool. Just maximize it. Okay. Now let's start the keynote. Maximize that as well. Okay. All right, here we go. And then Michael has to figure out how to switch the, so we have three apps to th switch between. So hopefully everything will go well. Uh, so as Andy introduced, my name is Christopher Nguyen. I used to be, uh, so more recently, an engineering director at Google, working on Google Apps. Uh, Mike is a co-founder of Adatao. Uh, he was most recently with Yahoo working on Hadoop. And um, today what I want to do is what I, what I threatened to do, which is to show you an actual demo of what we've been doing to realize the vision that we have of actually you know, providing data intelligence for all. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So I, I thought I'd jolt you up with uh, a riddle, right? So I think, I think in a room full of this many hackers, somebody's got to know the answer to this one. What do you get when you cross the Atlantic with the Titanic? OK. No guesses? OK, well, anyway, so the answer is about halfway. <laughs> OK, in case you think I'm mean in, in, in making a joke out of that, how about trying the next one? OK, I think this one you should get. What do you get when you cross big data with Hadoop? OK, all right. So, <laughs> all right, so, and that's why we're all here, right? Because we want more than just the, 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 the Hadoop layer. That's what Spark is all about. And I want to show you, okay, let's go to the next, what we've been, you know, working on. We've been talking, I promise this is the first time that anybody has seen what we're doing other than our customers. So that's, that's sort of a, phone, uh, a bonus. So in listening to a lot of enterprise users, so let's take a look at what, they're, what, what they want. And that's when we're going to switch over to the actual demo. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a, the actual uh, Datao P Insight application, which is a word processing document, right? So you can highlight, you know, insert an image, have text flows around, okay? But it turns out you can do a lot more than that with this document, okay? So 
let's go ahead and add and do some basic analysis on this. Uh, so what we're going to do, do is actually, so the, we're, we're talking to an EC2 cluster that is running uh, a data P, P analytics on top of Spark. And what Michael is doing is loading a data set, the airline data set. And those of you that are familiar with uh, data mining will recognize the airline data set is the one I believe is published by, or aggregated and published by the Department of Transportation. It has arrival delay information for all US airlines between 1988 and now. And so for the purpose of this, we're gonna look at 2007 data, right? And so when Michael is doing that, and hopefully that works, okay? So we're reaching, we're, we're, his, our client is a browser and is reaching into the cluster and the cluster is executing all of this uh, computation. Uh, yeah, that's taking a lot longer than necessary. <laughs> no, no, it can't be the network. Okay, you want to see what the cluster is doing? Murphy's Law. Okay, how about we go on with the keynote presentation <laughs> and you ask somebody to work on it? Okay. Okay, well, that would have been nice. We're gonna figure out whether we can do that uh, a little later. But what, what you would have seen is essentially data analysis, interactive visualization right inside that document. Okay. Uh, and that's what we're working on at Adatao, okay. So I'm gonna skip through this fairly quickly. This is essentially argues our point of view about how to look, how we look at big data but essentially, it's an evolution of business intelligence that I, I've been working in this field for, for enterprise software for quite some time. Um, let's skip through quickly. And so in the beginning, that you had business intelligence uh, on small data, and that's the first time the businesses could see what happened with the business, right? You can see revenues and aggregation of uh, customers and so on. Uh, and then something happened, which is big data happened, right? And so big data, if you look at all the definitions of the Vs about big data, velocity, volume, and so on, and that's all looking at big data as a problem, right? A lot of volume, too much data, too high velocity, and, and that's what things like uh, Hadoop and Spark is intended to solve, okay? So we're around 2010. The, the solution has arrived, sort of, right? But after people solve these big data problems, you're still back to original business intelligence, which is businesses looking backward, okay? So our point of view is that big data is a lot more than that, right? It's a big opportunity, right? Big data, for us, the definition is actually very simple. The difference between big data and small data is that you can learn from big data, things that you couldn't possibly learn from small data, right? And so applying machine learning, predictive analytics, and so on. And so we have built two things in particular. One is called P Insights, and the other is P Analytics. Okay, so P Insights is intended, what you saw earlier on that web page for the business user, right? A very user-friendly UI where people can derive, a sort of develop, so write an, a narrative of their data. Uh, and then we also have a P Analytics layer that is the actual big compute engine based on Spark. And out of that, the data scientists, in the data science community, typically the tools that are used are Python and R, so we have interfaces to that as well, okay? And this is being built by a very strong team. Uh, uh, basically, we have a, a, a small team, but all very strong people, uh, a lot of experience from enterprises like Google and Yahoo, and uh, mostly with PhDs from, in data mining and machine learning from UIUC, Georgia Tech, Stanford, and Berkeley, okay? But enough about us. So let, let's go back to this to see whether we can get this going. What's, what's the word? Okay. So, all right. 
So this is the data science view. Earlier you saw the business user view. For the data science view, how many people recognize this screen? Right, okay, very good. This is our studio, exactly. So what we have here is, sorry, can you go back up to the crucial line? This is, so you see on line two, there's loading of, of a library called adata.bigr. The rest is pretty standard. So what that library does is allow the local RStudio client to connect into the cluster and do its thing. Okay, and ahead of time, I think Michael has already made the connection, right, and, and load the data. This is the airline data set. Uh, go ahead and try to do and see whether it works. Uh, but essentially, the airline data set is 12 gigabyte, about 128 million rows, uh, 20 years. And so we just did that. So, okay, so we know the cluster is alive. Something was wrong with the, uh, with the web app. Uh, so Michael just did a aggregation of arrival delay by unique carrier, and uh, that's sorted by minimum delay. So we see, for example, Hawaiian Airlines the best. Okay, so th the key feature that I want to point out here is to an R data scientist that looks just like R, and that was a very important design goal for us, right? We didn't want the R data scientist to say, okay, learn MapReduce, and then I'll execute the R code in MapReduce for you. That defeats the purpose, you know. What we hear from customers is, say, if you make me do that, I might as well learn Java, right? Uh, and so, okay. So did you do the aggregation yeah. plot? Okay. So here also, there's a lot of uh, complex looking R, but you can, those of you who know R will recognize that as basic expectation of the R user, subsetting, filtering, and so on. And so what we've done is we built a heat map of that. Yep. Okay. So again, the, 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 the wonder of this is that it looks so normal, right? The R data scientists, the customer that uses, have no idea how much computing is happening in the cluster. The data frame representation is sitting in the cluster. The variable airline, uh, which you can't see because the screen is so squished, can you move it over? So the, we have a variable called airline that was defined, and it's actually a pointer with a UUID into uh, the, 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 the uh, cl cluster data frame. Okay, but to the R user, they think of that as a local data frame. And that, I think that's the magic. Okay, what else can we do? We can do basic aggregation, group by day of week. Let's try that. Okay, again, this aggregation is happening in the cluster. All right. Resize, there. Okay, so here you get some insights. Uh, for example, if you group all, and by the way, this is an aggregation over 120 million rows. That was what, five seconds? Uh, and you see that the best day to fly is Saturday, right? The next to last day there, and the worst day to fly is Friday, okay? And that's over uh, both arrival delay and departure delay. And what, one thing that when you do data science, one thing that you want to do is visualize it, right? You want to do data exploration first, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, how do you plot 120 million rows? Well, the answer is you don't, right? But for visualization, for exploration purposes, what you can do is just sample from that data set. So we can go ahead and do that. What we're doing is we're pulling 300 rows through this phone uh, from the cluster to the local uh, uh, data frame so that now we can do local uh, visualization. So what you can see here is already some insight. Uh, I don't know whether you can read it. That's arrival delay distance and departure delay. So you can see a strong correlation between arrival delay and departure delay. So that gives you some information when you're going to build a model next, that that's probably one of the key parameters, right? One of the key features to, to build a model out of. So yeah, go ahead and build a model, All right? Uh, so Michael is doing, right? So the only difference between this experience and the standard R experience is that string B-I-G-R, big R, right? Because normally the R data science person would do just LM, right? And, oh, you're done already. Good. Okay, so now that you build a model, he summarized it. You can see a lot of the output is all standard expectations of R. It has a p-value column. It has a coefficient column. Uh, okay, let's do some predictions. Uh, and this is a really nice thing about building this on top of Spark, right? So once you build the model, the model is still sitting in the cluster. Of course, we, we pull a copy of it. But because it's still sitting in the cluster, 
you can actually do predictions from the cluster itself. So it could be part of a production system. So there's no deployment of model, you know, export into PMML and then put it into a Java product. You know, there's, there's no 24 hour turnaround. You can actually do predictions directly. So here we're showing a, uh, for the purpose of the demo, we're doing a prediction and we're pulling down the prediction matrix, which is one column of predictions versus one column of actual values. And we're gonna try to do a scatter plot of that. Okay, well, something wrong with ggplot, so you can't see their scatter plot. Okay, but what you would have seen is, <laughs> okay. All right, so what else do you, what else do you wanna show? Okay, so Michael won, Mike wants a, a different chance, another chance. Okay, so that was the data science view, and people are actively using this now, right? Because you can see, so there's a lot more that we didn't show, but essentially we have random forest, k-means, uh, and those are actually fancy names, but actually it turns out users care a lot about the little things like, can I filter, can I add a column, can I go, for example, when you want to model something against day of week, well, day of week, is not a numeric value, right? You can't just say Monday is one and Tuesday is twice as, as big. Uh, so, so people want a, a way to say, well, I would just want to model against that. And so the way you do it is you generate a whole bunch of dummy columns, right? Zeros and ones. And so those are the things that turn out to be the heavy lifting that we add, that, that we do on behalf of the user so that they can just you know, live very comfortably and not have to deal with MapReduce. And Michael's, this is not working. Okay, you want to scroll up a bit? All right. Oops, okay. So we've loaded the airline the data. Let me check how am I doing on time. I'm, I'm good. Uh, so we can do a geo plot of the total row count by uh, origin. And so now this is really nice, right? Uh, for a business user. You can actually see the hubs, Atlanta, Chicago, and so on, right? Okay, and, and what we built is a natural language layer on top of the same engine that you, you've been seeing. Okay, so it's actually calling into the exact same cluster, doing the same data frame. In fact, they can share the same data you know, simultaneously. Okay, uh, let's continue with more of the P insights. Okay, so what else, what else can you do from here from a business user perspective? Actually, some pretty cool uh, natural language commands. Let's do some aggregation. Okay, show schema, go ahead. So this is just to show you that it's really the same data set, right? Uh, year, month, day of month, so the, the most interesting column is the column seven there, the, no, arrival, no, arrival delay somewhere, right? So we could build models against all of these columns. Okay, next. So we can, okay, so we go ahead and hit enter. In. So this is showing the lowest 10 unique carriers by average arrival delay. This is the same data that you saw earlier in the, in the R side, right? So again, I think Hawaiian Airlines is, is, is the best. And we actually checked the, 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 the news reports about this, and you can try this if you, if you like, you don't believe me. It, it turned out to be, it corresponds, right? So Hawaiian Airlines, and I think the next one is some somebody else from Hawaii also the lowest uh, uh, in terms of delays. Uh, next one, you go ahead. Uh, so what we're doing here is a grouping again, an aggregation by day of week, right, for the, for five unique carriers. Okay, there we go. Again, this, I like this better because it's so colorful. Uh, but again, you get the same insight. Saturday is the best day to fly, and, and Friday isn't. Anybody have any idea why that's the case? I'm sorry? I think something like that. Yeah, commute, and then also people love to, you know, there's discount. it's cheaper if you have a Saturday night stay, right? So Fridays. So it turns out, interestingly, Tuesday is also the same. But the nice thing about this is that because it is web-based, you can actually interact with the output. Uh, so as an example of that, how about we just look at Southwest Airlines, right? And here we're using a lot of the available libraries like D3, Vega, uh, Google Vis, and so on, right? So, yep, so similar trends. Can you clear 
Hawaiian Airlines as well? Uh, they won't go away. Yep. So there, that's an example. Let's look at Delta real quick. Uh, I think the trend is going to be the same. All right. So I, I didn't know about this. You know, I, I have some, some hints about, you know, what best days to fly and so on. But the data is very, very clear. Okay. Next, what are we going to do? Ah, okay. So we're going to do uh, what's called parallel coordinates. How many people have, have seen this, uh, this analysis before? Exactly. So it's a really nice way to do real-time filtering of data. Is that what you're doing? Okay. All right. So we're going to take that data and we're going to do parallel coordinates. Uh, well, you'll see it. It's, it's much easier than my trying to describe it. But we're going to do it on unique carrier, on air, air time, departure delay, arrival delay. Okay. So this is a reasonably intensive calculation. It might take a bit of time. Oh, I see. It's a lot of data to go across here. Yeah, I'll remember that next time. Uh, so here, for example, you see all these things, and, and this interactive graphic visualization allows you to interact with it. So for example, let's just look at only American Airlines. So we, there, we can filter that, right? So we can see American Airlines has been flying all those years. That seems pretty obvious, but let's go to uh, uh, US Airways all the way top. Right, so here, something happened to US Airways between 1995 and 2006. Right, and we looked it up, and and 1995, they actually changed their their carrier code from U.S. Air to U.S. Airways, and then around 2002 or something, I think partly due to 9/11, they went bankrupt, and then 2006, they merged with uh, America West. So, so the data sort of shows hints of all of that, and. Uh, you can do a lot of very interesting filters out of this, right? You can, for example, see which airlines are the worst in, in terms of delay. You can filter out, but in the interest of time, we'll, I think we'll just go to the next uh, kind of analysis. Okay. Uh, okay, so cluster. So this is really exciting, right? So we want to blur the boundary between basic descriptive statistics uh, an analysis, you know, into pre Predictive. You know, the user shouldn't have to say, "Well, I'm now entered the the, the realm of machine learning." You know, I, I got to carry guns or something, right? So we just want people to be able to say, "I want to cluster my data, right, into three groups," and here we we're clustering it by arrival delay and departure delay. So it actually just ran a k-means uh, algorithm in the cluster, and you see the cluster the the clusters come back pretty reasonable. There's a whole bunch of them that are less than zero delay, meaning they actually arrive early. And then for some reason it shows about 50 or 60 minutes for the next cluster and then everything that's worse, right? A lot longer, okay? So, and that, that's, that's what we want predictive analytics to be like. Right. To the user it's just, okay, cluster my data. Uh, what's next? Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so now we're going to switch back to show you a little bit more R. Except there's another surprise. We can actually do R right in here. So go ahead and create. So, so by typing greater than R, Michael can type in R code. And what, what that code is doing is he's creating a train, training data set and a test data set out of the same underlying data. And he's going to run a logistic regression on that. Okay. So the R user, if they want to, can interact in here. And so we, we see possible use cases like an R data scientist may actually give a business user a helping hand and say, well, I can help you do this. Right? It's in the same document. Right? Cool. And so he just built a, a uh, GLM model. That's logistic regression. To classify, if, you can, if you're fast, you can see he just classify whether a certain flight is late or on time or not late. Uh, and so because we're doing classification, we can also do random forest on it. So, okay.
Okay. There's there's something wrong with that copy and paste. That's okay. We we can skip this random forest. Uh, and then next we can try just just do ROC plot of, uh, of okay. Okay. See if the ROC plot works. Yeah. Okay. Did you lose the network? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, just 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 do this. Just do it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the data frame is missing. Yeah, so something is wrong with your with the string up there. That's okay. Okay. And then the last thing we want to show you here is you can actually do Python as well. Right. And those of you who are paying attention and have seen other things probably can expect that this is actually built on top of IPython. Right? But we've added natural language processing on top of it and we've extended the kernel of IPython to accept, you know, a switch between multiple languages. Okay. So we're just going to do a very simple, actually that's a very quick linear regression of an IPy of a Python based arrival delay versus departure delay. All right, cool. All right, so can we switch back out of demo hell? All right, so we've shown you, uh, well, essentially this is what was going on, right? We have a local client talking to the server uh, in EC2, and we've shown you P Analytics, which is the data science view, and then also P Insights, which is the business user view. Yep. So in the time available, I want to discuss what use cases our customers are, are, are using this for. All right. So the internet service provider that's using this essentially in-house, what they're doing is they're aggregating all of the transactional data from finance, HR, sales, marketing, and they're throwing all of that into Hadoop. Right? So that's a pretty common pattern, right? But when people do that, they run into this so-called, what I call it, the map reduce problem, right? So uh, you, I have the data storage underneath, but how am I gonna interact with it, right? And the comment that we hear from them is that because they're using things like Hive and Tableau, which has been, uh, at least in the Silicon Valley bubble that we live in, that, that's like old stuff, right? Uh, but what they describe is that it's very fragile and very non-agile, very slow. And, and so they're using a data what, the, what you're looking at, essentially, uh, on top of Spark to make that whole process much more agile, okay? Another use case is a customer service provider. So they have multi-channel, uh, mobile, web, and also phone. People call in for support and service. And they're taking all of that data and do predictive modeling on that to give better customer experience, the cross-channel selling and, and product recommendation, okay? There's a, uh, uh, actually we may have both, but anyway, we have two, one heavy equipment manufacturer that has a lot of sensor network data streaming in all the time, right? And up to now, it's been sitting inside, I think, MongoDB, right? And again, it's just, it they just, just goes in there and just sits there. They haven't done any analysis with it because it's, the, the, the analytics is just too expensive in terms of compute time. But with a data on top of Spark, they've been able to do that. And they're using it for initially some very, quote unquote, easy stuff that is predictive maintenance, right? Uh, when it's farming season and you have a piece of equipment that goes down, that's very, very expensive. So you want to be able to have just the right parts replacement, oil or whatever that is, you know, there on site ahead of the predicted uh, you know, equipment failure. Okay, and then finally, uh, the fourth use case I want to talk about is a mobile ad exchange that's using it for what else, right? CTR prediction and also ad targeting. And the interesting thing there is that it's massive data, right? Because it's a huge, huge click stream, many, many uh, hundreds of gigabytes per day. Uh, how are you doing on time? We're good. Okay, so then I'll tell you then we'll, we'll switch into scaling performance. So we've done this. 
I guess there's a couple of things to draw from this. One is that you can see that everything, in terms of 50 gigabytes, uh, 800 million data rows, is all done in, in seconds or tens of seconds. So this actually changes the game, right? There are things, so the difference in 10 seconds and say 10 minutes is not 60 times. It's actually infinity, right? Because once you cross a certain threshold, people will change their behavior and they won't do certain things. So when you can get things done in 10 seconds, the data scientists will sit down and actually do a lot of things with the data. Uh, we also looked at, from our perspective, we're very interested in comparing data throughput. And you can see at, uh, we can do LM uh, linear model as high as about one gigabyte per, yep, one gigabyte per second. So that's approaching RAM throughput. Uh, and the interesting thing is we, ha we haven't stressed it enough. We can see that the throughput is still increasing. Okay. So this is a 1.1 terabyte data set, and it's still within the realm of you know, a couple of minutes. Okay? And we've done scaling, holding the data set constant, and then increasing the number of cores, but also holding the, the, uh, the, the cluster size constant and then increasing data set size. And uh, as you can see here, the, the, the diagonal is a slope one, uh, pretty linear. So that, that is the end. Uh, so what I've talked about today is essentially shown you two things that we have built. One is P-Insight, which is a web-based application for business users, and uh, P-Analytics, which is the, the big compute layer with uh, R, Python, and actually also a Java API interface that you can build against. And, and this is a single stack, so they're not two separate things. Okay? And uh, we'll, if, if there are questions later, will be outside at our table on the side here, the a data table. Uh, and in closing, I want to thank everybody for being part of the Spark community, which is really what's enabled us to build all of this in such a short amount of time. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so we actually have time for a question or two, if somebody. Hi, you mentioned you have um, an R data frame on the cluster represented, or am I mistaken? That is correct. Do you have that code available to the public, or is that internal code? That's a great question. I've answered that question with the AMP labs multiple times, so I'm well practiced by now. Uh, so our intent is to actually do that. We want to share that back out to the community. Well, we have a small team, and we actually hold a very high bar for open sourcing. In other words, we want to do a good job of it, rather than just throw the code out there and then ignore all comments. And so we haven't been able to get around to dedicating one or two people to that yet. But that's certainly the intent. Uh, part, part of the thinking is also harmonizing that data frame representation with the MLlib table, ML table uh, representation. Right. Could you quickly outline the architecture you use to communicate between your REST API and Spark? Sure, I'll give you a chance to talk about that. <coughs> the, uh, can you say it again? I, I can't hear you uh, very well. Could you just outline the architecture that you use to uh, communicate between your REST API and Spark? The REST API and Spark. Okay. So actually, we use a Swift server. It's very similar, like Shock. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and then from uh, any client can talk to that Swift server and then uh, connect to the Spark context. So we have one Spark context or multiple Spark context, depend on your application. Uh, running all the time, and then uh, that is like a server in, in our point of view, and then uh, we connect uh, using trip, uh, trip connection protocol to connect to that. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. And, and I will add, as many people are finding out, both Java and Scala, because we find it convenient to do some things in Java and other things in Scala. All right, let's thank them again.